All right, welcome. It's indisputable. We got a lot on the agenda today. Good to be with you. We also have some updates and I want you to pay close attention to the updates because there's opportunity for you, you to get involved and make a dynamic difference, not only in this nation, but also across the planet. We're gonna start engaging in that today. Uh, joining me for my bullpen segment, my debate segment, none other than Armstrong Williams, broadcast owner and journalist. We will talk about cancel culture. We will highlight Christopher Columbus and Dave Chappelle. You don't get that kind of debate every day. Also, <laughs> co-hosted with me, my contributor today, Dina Dahl, attorney at law, law and crime legal analyst will join us to break down the news. My top story for today, the New York City Board of Health. They have now declared racism a public health crisis, finally. And you know who's outraged? Racist. You know who else are outraged? Republicans. Some of y'all will get that in a minute. Okay, the New York City Board of Health, they have declared racism a public health crisis. Uh, they passed a resolution declaring <laughs> that racism is in fact a public health crisis. The four page resolution, which passed on Monday, went into effect immediately. Now, people are outraged on the other side of this. So obviously racist individuals are saying, "Oh my goodness, look at the woke culture permeating through governmental entities. And then you have those who are uh, just on the wrong side of the narrative, wrong side of the conversation. But let me help you define what a health crisis is. Here's the definition of a health crisis. A health crisis generally has significant impacts on community health, loss of life, and on the economy that may result from disease. That's one possibility. Industrial processes and or poor policy. It literally fits the textbook definition of a health crisis. Racism does impact life, it impacts liberty, economy, it impacts all of that. Maybe not through the medium of an actual disease as the traditional sense, but definitely through industry and poor policy. So the board was correct, it gets deeper. One of the 23 points in the resolution claims that involvement with law enforcement has grown markedly in the, U in the US in recent decades. And studies have shown these interactions are associated with poor health outcomes, including injuries and fatalities. Once again, another common sense connection between health and policy, between progress and protocol. The resolution also decries structural racism. Remember that terminology because once again, it's a trigger word for racist and Republicans. Structural racism in impacting services and care across all institutions within our society. And in New York City, through discriminatory housing, employment, education, healthcare, criminal, legal, and other systems, all of which result in avoidable and unjust health outcomes, it does. Now, people have a problem with the terminology structural racism. Well, here's the definition of that. You have to define these variables while we are engaging in conversation. It means a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various ways, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. Boom, it's amazing to me how individuals who will say yes, racism exists. Yes, bias exists. Yes, we need to do better will also then deny that structural racism is a thing. They will deny systemic or institutional bias is a thing while admitting it is a thing under a different terminology. It goes deeper, nine of the actions of the resolution calls for the uh, calls for include the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene establishing a data for equity internal working group 
to ensure the health department apply an intersectional anti-racism equity lens to public health data and provide annual guidance to other NYC mayoral agencies on best practices to collect and make available to the health department relevant data to track and approve health equity. Who in the hell would be against any of that? If we're talking about collecting better data in order to have a better outcome or understanding of a disparity related to a potential outcome, who would be against that? The people who are against it simply do not like the framework of racial disparity. But you cannot ignore racial disparity when the data points back to a racial context for the reason the disparity exists. Now there are other reasons too, you can apply classism, sometimes even genderism is applicable. But you cannot ignore racism as a reality for the disparity you see. Finally, the resolution requests that the New York City Health Department continue collaborations with sister agencies to report on fatalities, injuries, health conditions by race, gender, and other demographics to improve what? Data quality and care. You see, here's the issue. You cannot have quality health care, targeted health care response without good data. This is really a resolution to collect better data. That's the aim, that's the goal of the New York City Board of Health. Who would have a problem with more comprehensive data? Well, naturally, the Republicans, conservatives, not all of them, but the loud ones, yes. Attorney, what are your thoughts here? Are they on the right track with this? Absolutely, and you can't underestimate how important this is. Most scientific developments of our time have all happen because of government funding or government involvement. The private sector can't make a large change or leaps in development the way the government can. So the fact that one of the largest public health departments in the country is going to collect huge amount of data. And not only that, but then have actionable recommendations on it is the kind of like change that people have really been wanting and we do need the government to do it. No private company could ever come close to doing what this public health department is going to do. And I thought the commissioner kind of said it so well. He, you know, this came about because the coronavirus disproportionately affected communities of color. And it was because they had more underlying conditions. But why did they have more underlying conditions? You know, because of this racism. And he said it was because disinvestment, discrimination, and um, what was the third thing? And disinformation. Mm -hmm. And I, those three Ds, I thought that was great. And that's what they're going to try to tackle. Yeah, that's remarkable and very well stated. Um, let me take us to uh, the New York Police Department, okay? New York police, they are in violation of the law. There's a standing wear your mask rule on transit systems, etc. It is a $50 fine enforced by the New York police. But naturally, they think they are above the law, okay? So much so that when a citizen has the audacity to say, hey guys, you all are supposed to wear your mask. Can you please do so for my protection and the protection of others? How can you enforce a law that you are openly violating yourself? When a passenger said this to the New York police, here's what they did to that passenger. Initially, when this first started, the officers, according to the narrative, they were acting as if they could not understand what the man was saying, okay? They were playing games, right? So they have the mask, wearing it down. Some did not even bother to put it on. Maskless NYPD cops decided to shove a passenger off of the transit in order to stop him from telling them what the law says. Now, that's just sick when you think about it.
You are in a position to enforce the law. A person who is simply telling you what the law is, expecting you to follow the law, you are being paid by taxpayer dollars. And then you respond in this way. The male officer was playing dumb and claimed he could not hear me according to the victim here. I kept asking him over and over, do you know it's illegal not to wear a mask? I kept asking him the same thing and then he said, you're being disruptive. Which I guess in there is their keyword for doing whatever they want if they declare you disruptive, okay? Mr. Gilbert said the cop just snapped and decided to shove him out through the platform gate. That's the video you saw. He just walked into me, grabbed me and pushed me. He grabbed me by the shirt and pushed me over to the emergency exit and slammed me through it and was yelling at me. If you're not going to ride the train, you can get out. Gilbert documents cops in defiance of the mandate. This is part of what he does, he holds them accountable. The MTA, Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the leaders have repeatedly pleaded with NYPD to be better at wearing masks on trains and indoor stations as the agency requires of all of its riders to stem the spread of COVID-19. The NYPD and the MTA's own policy, the police department can issue a $50 fine for riders who do not comply with the mask rules. Well, do it, damn it. Great, it's in writing, do it, 50 bucks, $50. Every time you do it, you come back $50, all right? If you don't pay it, we take it to court, citation, court hearing. You don't come to court, warrant for your arrest. See, that's what it means not to be above the law. That's what it means to actually be held to just this, the standard of the law. And the truth is, they really should be held to a higher standard of law. They are in fact law enforcement agents. And when you get into other professions, such as being a psychiatrist, psychologist, a medical doctor, they are held to a higher standard of application. A higher, not lower, but higher. And then when it comes to the profession of policing, for some reason, we must hold them to a lower standard of the industry standard. Attorney, this doesn't make sense to me, but we continue to see it happen over and over again. Why would cops ever believe that they should be held to the same standard or a higher standard when routinely we hold them to a lower standard? You know, and I think we all have probably experienced this. I mean, I've had a police officer speed past me, not going to an emergency, but just because he can, you know, speed, whereas I would get a ticket if that happened. But like you said, I mean, maybe there should be some sort of like ethical code of conduct for police officers. I mean, we have it as lawyers, you know, you would think that a police officer with the law enforcement should be held to a higher standard. But it's often not the case. Or also politicians, we see this. People with power somehow feel as if they are above the law. You know, it's one thing if the NYPD decided as a rule they don't want to cover their faces because they want people to be able to see who they're interacting with as a way of like checking them. Okay, I can see that argument, but that's not what's happening. If you have a rule, if you have a policy, you should be following that policy. I don't see why they wouldn't. And definitely not harassing and physically assaulting citizens for telling you what the law actually says, um, completely out of bounds. Let me bring you to a story we covered already and we have an update for you and for you to get involved. Let's go to the video of Ms. Chantel Arnold uh, who was brutally attacked by a sheriff's deputy from Jefferson Parish, here it is. That pisses me off. The woman that you saw being harassed and criminally dealt with by this criminal cop had just been assaulted by teenagers before 
this encounter happened. And as she's trying to get home, this deputy says, stop, talk to me. She says, I'm trying to get home, I've been harassed, I just wanna go home. And instead of being sensible, instead of employing other tactics, other ways to remedy the situation, he decides to assault her a second time. Now, here's why I'm bringing this to your attention, okay? Um, we're going to start a petition. You see, the Jefferson Parish uh, Sheriff's Department, they have refused to let us know who this person is, who did this assault, okay? So here's what we wanna do. Uh, Miss Arnold, her name is Chantel Arnold, Miss Arnold was uh, brutalized, she suffered injury, um, and she is still recovering, okay? Uh, it included bruises, scratches, a busted lip, recurring headaches, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so now we are calling on the Jefferson Parish, Louisiana Sheriff, Joseph P. Lopinto III, to fire the unnamed police officer. This brutal attack would never be allowed in any place of work. It most definitely should not be tolerated in our police departments. So here's the petition. And I'm sure we will get it on our streaming as well for those who are watching via our streaming platforms. Um, You can go right now to tyt.com forward slash petitions. On that page, the first one you see is for Miss, Miss Chantel Arnold, I want you to sign it. I want you to sign it, I want you to get that link, grab that link, put it on your social media, get your friends to sign it. I want 10,000 signatures, that's what we're gonna do here. So please be involved in transforming the reality of policing in this country, because this woman was attacked twice. Twice within minutes by a cop the second time. And they are hiding and protecting this scumbag. I got more I want to say, but I'm out of time. Uh, Dina Dahl, what are your thoughts here? I mean, first, thank goodness you're bringing this attention because violence against black women are not is not given the kind of attention by the media that it should. So first of all, this was a horrible assault and I'm so glad that you're bringing attention to it. I've seen you know, covering criminal cases that a lot of times like with the Brianna, Brianna Taylor, the police officers had a lot of complaints against them. Usually when a police officer yeah. is involved in something, there's a trail. So you know, let's not create the next horror horrible thing this police officer is gonna do. This assault should be enough. Like you said, he's a law enforcement, he assaulted a woman. You know, let's do this position, yeah. P- petition. Yeah, he should be held accountable. Uh, Ms. Arnold was not charged with any crime whatsoever. We got more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back, we have a lot of show left. Uh, let me make sure I remind everyone. Uh, a new Twitch exclusive, okay? Um, Francesca, Wednesday, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time, twitch.tv slash TYT. It is the Twitchuation Room. And our dear sister will break down top stories of the week while interacting and engaging with the amazing Twitch audience. Also, Senator Nina Turner. We'll host the conversation today featuring the founder of the Arab American Institute, Dr. James Zogby. That's going to be an amazing interview. 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 2.30 p.m. Pacific Time, tyt.com forward slash live. Don't forget to sign the petition. Do not forget to sign the petition because we are looking for justice for our dear sister, Chantel Arnold. Uh, who was brutally assaulted, okay? So make sure you sign that petition at tyt.com forward slash petitions. It's the first one you see on that page, okay? Um, Yep, and Senator Nina Turner will be with us tomorrow. That is her day with me, all right? We're gonna cover a lot of stories. All right, what if I told you that there's a teenage kid standing outside Selling candy. 
and he gets arrested and punched in the face by a cop. But that's exactly what happened to one 19 year old. We have the video, here it is. Let me remind you that this teenage kid got the same treatment for selling candy as if somebody were selling narcotics. Who does this? Hmm? This was in California, by the way. Let me give you some background. Um, police said officers first approached 19 year old um, Edmund Franklin after someone called 911 to report he had been asked to leave by employees of a nearby business for allegedly becoming aggressive with them, okay? Franklin was arrested on what? Suspicion of trespassing. What the hell is suspicion of trespassing? Resisting an officer and attempting to disarm an officer, really? That's what happened there? I saw a scared teenager. That's it. Um, Hamet police said, adding that his bail was set at $10,000. Following the social media backlash, uh, police said in a statement, we are reviewing the incident to include the social media post and the officer's body worn camera video. Uh, This incident, like any use of force incident involving a Hamet police officer is taken seriously. And will be thoroughly investigated. Uh, Obviously, they don't want to tell you details of who did this. Here is the chief of police. We got a picture of him. His name is Eddie J. Pust, who is at the helm of the operation. So let's be very clear. This is a young black male who is selling candy. Somebody decides to call the police on him and That means you think a gun is required for this kid who's selling candy. Everyone, every patron who was in that parking lot defended this teenager and said he's only selling candy. They didn't know him. They're not family members of the kid. They're not even friends with the kid. They saw injustice and they spoke out. Now, how is it that all of us are wrong? How can we all be wrong and somehow only the police are right? How is that? Because that's the line they are going to take when they deal with this matter. Suspicion of trespassing. Attorney, let me ask you this, Ms. Dahl, because I'm learning a little something in law school about uh, trespassing laws right now, okay? We haven't covered suspicion of trespassing. You either are trespassing or you're not. And then there are exceptions to the trespass rule, such as children, if somebody else made you trespass without your fault. But what is suspicion of trespass and how does it apply here? My guess is they are still collecting evidence and aren't sure if they actually want to charge him with trespassing. Mm. And that's why they're saying suspicion of trespassing. You know, either way, how this police officer handled it. You know, we expect training. We expect there to be dis, you know, de-escalation. The person who escalated the situation here was not that child. It was the police officer, and that's wrong because he's the one with the gun. That's right. That's right. 
Um, so we saw escalation, uh, serious escalation. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You're still Back off! I said, there's an African American man threatening my life. Oh no, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna do that. You're not gonna call somebody that word. I don't care who it is. I don't care who you are. Excuse me? ASU is oh, I went to Stanford and UC Berkeley. Did you? Not today. The Karenicity is deep here. Now, here's another thing that we've learned. Remember, we're keeping a running log of what makes a Karen a Karen, okay? I'm adding something to it. Karens are allowed to say the N word according to Karenicity 101 if they went to Stanford, UC Berkeley, or have a master's degree. Because obviously she was qualifying the reason why she should be able to talk down to others and call them the N word. Because she went to Stanford, UC Berkeley, and she has a master's degree. According to the background here, this took place in Arizona. According to TikTok, TikToker Tizzy Ent. Uh, who reacted to this video, this Karen behaved like this because her ticket was not validated. And the security guard, who is an African American male, requested that she step off at the next stop just to get validated and come back on to the platform. Well, no, how dare you do your job? Um, this is quite interesting. So, you know, I decided to consult with the Urban Dictionary here. And here's what the Urban Dictionary says Karenism is. Karenism is a fake disorder directed to entitled men, women by numerous Redditors. Uh, The main symptoms of Karenism are rampant entitlement thing and anti-vaccine belief. Now, we don't have any proof here that this particular Karen is an anti-vaxxer, but I would bet good money that she is. All right, attorney, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, the comment in the video later on, the man says, well, I, you know, I dare her to like go in the middle of those college campuses and say that word and see what Mm -hmm. their reaction would be because they definitely aren't gonna defend something like that. But you know, I just wanna highlight here the anti-Karen as you've been talking about, because there was that recent um, report about the rape that occurred on a Philadelphia train for 40 minutes and some of the passengers recorded it and not one of them called 911. So, you know, I know sometimes Sometimes we kind of joke about the anti Karens, but they are essential in our community and good for this man for speaking up. And we need people to do that because that's just horrendous what happened to that woman. Yeah, and you bring up something very powerful because the reality is we do need people to, to step up, to stand out, to speak up for, for others who are being disenfranchised, who are being accosted, who are being arrested unlawfully, okay? Um, The issue is this, the issue is this. We've always had people like that in the world, right? We've always had individuals willing to step up. We call it anti-Karen or anti-Karenism on this show to, to help us to contextualize what's happening, to identify it and to know what it is, right? But we, we need more people like that. Here's the thing about being neutral, and I, and I talked to a friend of mine not too long ago um, who was on this big, you know, I just kind of stay out of it kick. Well, the one thing about being neutral is that you're guaranteed to never be right. You can never be on the right side of an issue if you are always neutral on an issue. And so it's time out for that. Uh, the political correctness associated with not getting involved and not speaking up. And here's the truth, 
uh, Ms. Dahl, many times people do not speak up because they don't want to potentially sacrifice themselves. They don't want to be in the um, video that may be recorded. They, they don't want to be seen uh, in the national headlight. And that's why we here, we're going to promote you in a positive way. If you are willing to step up, stand out and be provocative in your defense of somebody who needs your defense, you will receive praise on this program. You will not be a villain here. You will be protected here and we're going to encourage that behavior all over this country and beyond. And we believe that that will start changing the social dynamic and the social narrative. All right, so we got more on the other side. I need to remind everybody, make sure you sign the petition, all right? Make sure you sign the petition for Ms. Chantel Arnold, who was physically abused, criminally assaulted, by a sheriff deputy, okay? We all have to stand behind individuals um, like her. We have to support them, we have to give them strength. And the reason why cops get away with doing this is because primarily they do not believe they are connected to a community. They don't believe they're connected to a community of people who will stand up and be loud and say, no way in the hell are you going to get away with this. Do you believe that sheriff deputy would have done that to a white woman on a particular side of town? Of course not, of course not. He would have utilized his training. He would have possibly called in an intervention specialist as per protocol states. He would have treated her like a victim. But because this is a black woman on a certain side of town, he treated her like a criminal after she was already criminalized, okay? After she was already victimized and then she was criminalized by this particular cop. And let me remind you, never, she was never charged with any crime. She did nothing wrong. You saw how she was thrown around by this cop. You saw how she was physically abused by this cop. She was never charged with a single crime because she did nothing illegal. She was so she was so right in what she was doing, he couldn't even make up a charge against her, mm. okay? He couldn't even make one up. So I want you to sign that petition. I'm sure we have it in our streaming. Um, the is it T, what is the petition again? Let me tyt.com forward slash petitions, tyt.com forward slash petitions. It is the first one there, so make sure you sign that. We want to get 10,000 signatures quick, fast, and hurry. I appreciate you in advance. We got more on the other side, it's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. Let me read some of these amazing comments. Uh, we got a lot of them. Uh, TYT member Mickey C. the Silver Hair Dragon. Bail said at 10,000, many Capitol rioters were released without bail. That's right. Lynn, oh my God, imagine if he was selling weed, uh, he'd be dead. That, that, he gets that from selling candy. Why couldn't the officer just say, hey, you know, um, move on to the other side for, for an hour or two, okay? Because somebody around here called the police on you. See, that's sensible, right? Somebody called the police. I remember there's a there's a story, and it's on YouTube, of a neighbor who called the police on black children playing basketball. Great, they're playing basketball. The police arrive, they figure out, okay, you're calling the cops because these kids are playing basketball. You know what the cop did? He started playing basketball with the kids. There you go, all right. Um, Lynn says, I'd hate to see what that cop would do if a black girl scout was selling her cookies. Yep, YouTube super chat, Wilson Pina. I hate the fact that they could lie as much as they want and keep their damn job. Archie 15, she has an MS and a PhD in bigotry <laughs> from Stanford and UC Berkeley. Don't forget that, all right, that's according to her. Uh, Aaron Okianos, a master in Karenicity, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, Sasha G, uh, I guess they didn't teach her how to be a decent person. Yeah, uh, Michael Taylor, cop, excuse me, ma'am. I'm feeling rather racist and insecure <laughs> in my masculinity and I need to slam you to the ground. Woman, the hell? Yeah, Twitch, 
Kela Kell, 1994, I hope I said that right. Always a black child who gets penalized by grown white men. Phoenix 32778, we need a petition for justice for this young man, we do. Let's get on it, okay? A glitteriest Lady Dread, Karenicity of the best contemporary Karen doctrine and guide to be best. <laughs> All right, okay, there's an anti-masker who goes around and agitates people. Well, this particular anti-masker, um, she has now threatened to make a citizen's arrest. She compares uh, the store policy, it's a pastry, uh, to the Holocaust. Here it is. <laughs> Discrimination? We don't discriminate. Well, is it a law? Should we call the sheriff and ask him to explain the law? My manager told me that. Well, then let's call law enforcement because this is a problem. This is not a law, and I am under no obligation to wear a mask. I'm sorry, this is what my manager told us. So, in Nazi Germany, when your manager told you to like shove people in the ovens, you would do that, I guess. I'm asking a real question. You have ovens, don't you? Yeah. Okay, well, I will stand here until the law enforcement comes. Because I'd like to make a citizen's arrest of you. This is discrimination. One, discrimination is not an arrestable offense, number one. Number two, I don't think you have a grasp of citizen's arrest because that means you don't need to share if you're going to make one. Uh, also, uh, the audacity of this individual to compare the horrific the horrific nature of the of the Holocaust to her not allowed entry because she does not follow the policy. Now remember, these are some of the same people who deny systemic racism exists, but would claim to be discriminated against when it comes to a mask policy. Supreme Court has already settled this, it is settled common law. Um, stores, establishments, they have the right to enforce these common sense policies. No shoes, no no um, shirt, no mask, no service. They can do that, it's completely legal. Um, but this particular uh, person goes too far. So let me give you an update of who she is. Let's put up a picture. Um, her name is Christina Kelso, Kelso, uh, Patriots versus everybody. I mean, that's a proud race, I mean American. Yes, um, she was questioned by the FBI for January, for the January trip to DC and her ties to people like Hostetter and Taylor and the American Phoenix Project, a charity started by Hostetter to defend human and civil rights and educate the public about vaccines. She also regularly records herself fighting with and harassing store employees over mask policies. Well, she wants to be famous. Let's help her out, put up a picture again. Let's see a picture, there, there it is, Patriots versus everybody, Miss Christina Kelso. Okay, um, Miss Dahl, can she make a citizen's arrest here? No, I mean, if anything, she's trespassing. This is a private property. They're allowed to decide who can come onto their property or not. Masks is a you know, a rule for them. So absolutely not. Like she's the one that doesn't know the law, not vice versa. Um, it's just so horrendous though, what she says to that employee. Yeah. I mean, it's revealing the depths of uh, the depravity there, to be quite honest. You know, she's obviously doing this for self promotion. She goes into the business on purpose because she knows that they don't have a mask. And then she chooses to say, really, one of the most hateful things you can say to somebody. And what do you say to that? Other than, um, you know, it's just very disturbing. Yeah. And here's the thing I need companies to go ahead and stop playing with these Karens. Stop playing with them, all right? Once you ask them to leave one time and they do not, call 911. That's how you deal with it. We're trying to, you know, converse, negotiate, explain. Damn that. 
they are coming there with the agenda of violating a policy that protects your patrons and your company. That's what they are there to do, to disrupt and violate your right to have a common sense health policy at your establishment. Once you request, hey, you gotta go. Once you make that demand and they do not leave, that is then trespass, okay? It's real simple. It only takes one time. As a matter of fact, you probably need to invest in a sign that says, um, all Karens are automatic trespassers on this property. That may hold up legally, I don't know. Okay, all right, I got a question for you. What in the red state hell? You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face, it's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now, what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math, somebody say amen. What was this? When I was on vacation, I was watching the news and they said, there's this uh, indigenous day. What was it called? In what? I couldn't even pronounce it. I said, I am indignant that they're doing that to my Columbus Day. It's still Don't Columbus you day. dare play woke and start, and you that are watching me, it ain't indigenous, whatever it is. You need to be indignant day. Christopher Columbus, the history of our nation, and stop the nonsense. Man, I wanted to put signs in my yard. Christopher Columbus Day. Yeah, but don't you know he was this? How do you know? I don't believe anything that they just changed in the last few years. <laughs> Amen. Let's stop. Say this with me, because I feel the atmosphere that our words are carrying power. Can we speak to the woke culture? Stop the nonsense. We ain't buying it. Y'all know if you are a member of that church, you're following a man <laughs> who can't say indigenous. You do understand this, right? You are taking advice from a guy who can't say the word nor define the word, that's number one. Number two, I know you know by now that Christopher Columbus did not discover America. You, you understand that, you don't have to be woke to understand a fact. He did not discover America. Uh, this is Pastor Hank, uh, Pastor Hank is mad that Columbus Day is being replaced by Indigenous Peoples Day, which by the way, this is not a new thing. You've had governments all over the United States of America passing this statute or resolution to change the names, all right? And rightfully so. So he's upset about this only because Christopher Columbus represents white supremacy and they are mad about the canceling of Christopher Columbus. It is the correction of history. Dina, what are your thoughts here? You know, it's one thing to have an opinion, right? He could have whatever opinion he wants. But when he speaks at a pastor at a church, he could actually violate the 501c3. As a nonprofit, they cannot be political churches. Otherwise, they would have to pay taxes. So there was not one mention of religion in that. It was really all politics. And, you know, we have separation of church and state for a reason in this country. And they should have the repercussions of maybe getting their tax benefit taken away when they become a political forum like this. Yeah, a friend of mine told me, a very wise guy said, if you want a lot to remain protected, put it inside of religion. <laughs> It'll permeate forever. Okay, um, Steve Bannon, white nationalist, really self-admitted white nationalist, self-proclaimed, I believe him. He has now decided to ignore a congressional subpoena. What needs to happen? He needs to be arrested. That's what is that's what needs to happen now. Because if you ignore it, or if I ignore a subpoena, we get a warrant out for our arrest. That's how it works. You know why? Because we're not above the law. That's why. Okay. Here's what Adam Schiff said leading up to this. I think it's enormously important, and I view this as an early test of our democracy and whether it's recovering. 
uh, an early test of whether in the new administration, no one will be above the law. Uh, I can tell you that if you or I or anyone else refused to show up when they were subpoenaed, they would be arrested. It should be no different for Steve Bannon. Okay, well, uh, here's what the chairman of the select committee, Chairman Thompson said. Witnesses who have been subpoenaed have a legal obligation to do so. And when you think about what we are investigating, a violent attack on the seat of our democracy perpetrated by fellow citizens on our constitution, an attempt to stop the certification of an election. It's shocking to me, shocking that anyone would not do anything in their power to assist our investigation. So it's a shame that Mr. Bannon has put us in this position, but we won't take no for an answer. Y'all gonna have to lock his ass up. I'm telling you right now, he's not coming voluntarily. Here's why, he doesn't wanna lie under oath, okay? Because then you really got him. If he lies under oath, he's done, okay? You put Michael Cohen in prison, you gotta put Steve Bannon in prison if he lies under oath. He does not wanna do that, he does not want to come there under oath. And here's the game plan. He's going to try to run the clock out because he thinks during the midterm election, the whole thing will shift to Republican control and they would then rescind the subpoena. That's what his attorneys are trying to wait out. That's his strategy in order to ignore the subpoena. Now, there has to be some maneuvering here because there's a relay of the subpoena. Now that he has ignored it, Congress can vote on it. And then the Department of Justice can choose to actually investigate and charge. But there's a little known statute that the Supreme Court decades ago said Congress has the power to enact. And that is to order their sergeant at arms to go lock up somebody who has refused to comply with the congressional subpoena. It's time that you all start using what is at your disposal. Stop playing with these guys. All right, Attorney Dahl, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, at minimum, he should be held contempt of Congress. There were about 12 different witnesses that were subpoenaed. He was the only one who produced nothing. I mean, I could see his argument that maybe some were executive privilege, but Congress will no longer be effective if they allow people to do this. I think though that they probably won't use their sergeant at arms. It's never happened in modern history. And I don't know if they have that political will to do that right now. I hope they at least hold him in contempt. You know, this executive privilege argument that Trump is bringing through the courts is gonna be interesting because it's a novel. Nobody has decided who has authority over that, former presidents or current presidents. And that could go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Yeah, we shall see. So while it has never happened in modern times, there is precedent long, long time ago of sending a sergeant at arms to actually lock up a brother of the president. Okay, research that is a fascinating constitutional narrative. Ms. Dahl, thank you so much for always being remarkable and on indisputable. Thank you so much for having me as always. I'm on Twitter, ask Dina Dahl one. Okay, uh, let me remind everyone to sign the petition. All right, you saw that sheriff's deputy brutally assault that black woman walking down the street who already was assaulted right before that. He then assaulted her again, okay? So we wanna make sure that we expose that situation. They are hiding this deputy. They are promising us an investigation that's taking place. Damn it, we need to know who he is. So you can sign the petition, tyt.com forward slash petitions, tyt.com forward slash petitions. Her name is Chantel. Arnold. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.